Of course, we know about the oil market, the fruit and vegetable market, the sugar market. What do they have in common? Buyers and sellers everywhere always look out for their own interests. The law of supply and demand controls these exchanges. The crime world is no exception to the rule. All trafficking has an economic reason to exist. A mafia, a criminal enterprise, is first and foremost a business with its own products to deliver and services to perform. The organized crime market generates around $870 billion a year. Where does this money come from? Trafficking in every form. The more illegal it is, the more profitable it is. So who are the main players in these underground markets? How are they organized? Who benefits from the illegal profits? This is what Dirty Dollars reveals. It's a journey behind the scenes of the criminal economy. If there's one product that we find in the hands of both criminals and law enforcement, it's the revolver, the rifle, the gun. Some buy them legally, others have to turn to a parallel criminal market, arms trafficking. Weapons trafficking is conducted the same way as any other traffic. Arms trafficking is a profitable activity, but most importantly, because it is cross-cuttingly connected to many other forms of crime, organized crime, terrorism. Uh, because you've got terrorists on the other end who are looking to get, to get firearms, you are looking at, uh, at uh, organized crime. Both entities have the money to pay top dollar, as we say, or top euro for a firearm. Um, it is the instrument, it is the facilitating, the enabler that increases the power and the threat of other forms of crime. Arms trafficking is a very special market in the criminal world. A weapon is really the only sure way to protect an illegal activity. And as it also enables criminals to increase their market share by eliminating their competition, sometimes literally, it's both an investment and a guarantee. It's a necessary product for any self-respecting mafia, and of course, for all the law enforcement officers who are fighting them. This is what makes weapons trafficking so unique and complex. It is narrowly linked to the legal firearms trade. Emery Galois from the NGO Amnesty International confirms this fact. Initially, weapons sold in arms trafficking come from the legal trade. We consider that 80 to 90 percent of the weapons on the black market are originally from legal trade authorized by the state. In 2013, the Arms Trade Treaty, or ATT, was signed by 130 states. The objective? To limit trafficking while better monitoring traditional markets. It offers guidelines of good practices and monitoring tools. For the moment, only 61 states have ratified it. Transparency, even in the legal market, won't happen tomorrow. The legal arms market is estimated at around 80 billion euros a year. It's only an approximation, because this evaluation is only based on available data. Yet the arms trade still remains one of the least transparent economic sectors. And we all know why, either for national security or other reasons. Topping the list of countries that communicate the least about their business activities linked to weapons are Iran, Israel, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. Generally, in Europe, it's a rather transparent business. If the official market is murky, then it goes without saying that the illegal market is even more opaque. In a nutshell, weapons trafficking is not the private turf of criminal organizations and mafias. In many respects, it's also a lucrative market for nations and governments. To get a general idea of its reach and understand the way weapons trafficking is organized, we'll approach it from a purely economic point of view. Just as in the traditional market, you need factories to manufacture the product. But there are two distribution networks, the gray market and the black market. And in both cases, the goal is the same, making as much money as possible. 
It's important to note one unique aspect of this market in the criminal universe. Those who participate in the trafficking don't need to own the production tools. The factories belong to private, respectable companies monitored by government authorities. We have some official information about the weapons market. The biggest weapons exporter is the United States, which alone supplies nearly 170 countries. Followed by China, but that's purely speculation because the country doesn't communicate its figures. Russia is in the third position, followed by France and the United Kingdom. The small arms production is industrialized, and today it's a highly competitive area of international trade. There are more than 1,100 companies throughout the world, and they produce millions of weapons and tons of ammunition every year. At the end of the Cold War, military expenditure dropped, and so did production. Then, from 2001, with a new type of war, the war against terrorism, we see an increase in arms sales, and thus of the production. Among the market's biggest players, there's one name that everyone knows, Kalashnikov. Its name first brings to mind the famous AK-47, whose real name is Automatic Kalashnikov Model 47. It is estimated that there are still around 100 million of them in working condition around the world today. Kalashnikov is also the name of a person, Mikhail Kalashnikov, the designer of the weapon, as well as the name of a modern corporation which has developed a range of war equipment and sports weapons bound for international markets. The main gigantic factory is located in Injevsk, a city somewhere in the Ural Mountains. All Westerners were forbidden access to the city until the early 2000s to avoid any risk of espionage. Alexei Krivoruchko is the current CEO of the corporation. Like any other leader, his first ambition is the international success of his company in an economic context that's particularly difficult for Russia. The civil and military weapons market is huge. For a few years we lost our position, but now we're back on top. We're talking about billions of dollars. Russia faces international sanctions following its implication in the Ukrainian conflict in particular an embargo on our arms sales. Economically, it's a real shortfall for the company. The Kalashnikov factory is one of the most modern in the world. Its workers are hand-picked and pampered. It's a high-end company, eager to be successful in a global market where competition is fierce. Obviously, the main civilian firearms market is the American market, which unfortunately is close to us at the moment. But we are currently developing other markets and we've been able to improve our sales in the last few years. Actually, our sales aren't in first position yet, but we are working on it. And we increased our exports five times and it's not over yet. Now we have to come up with new models and we are almost there. Over the last year, we've been on the market with new, much more modern prototypes to increase our profits. The research and development of new products is the battleground where money is won and lost. The company tests the weapons of tomorrow in a testing center. Among their new inventions is an automatic rifle that's dreadfully effective. A product presentation is worth a thousand words. It's a recoilless rifle. Look, we can hold it this way. Recoilless, look. Completely still. If you look at the worldwide production of weapons, you can hardly ignore the few more or less professional manufacturers found in conflict zones. There's a non-industrial production considered as artisanal. In Afghanistan or in Pakistan, you'll find so-called craftsmen who are able to produce a weapon more or less corresponding to factory criteria and who can repair weapons. 
However, these weapons never attained the quality of those from the legal market, distributed by the main producers. At Interpol's headquarters, they pay special attention to the weapons industry. John Hagman coordinates the program against weapons trafficking for the international organization. A licensed manufacturer within a country uh, manufactures the firearms, sells them, generally speaking, to the government or to a broker, and then from there it goes either to military or into civilian possession. All of it done with proper paperwork, and all of that is legal firearms manufacturing and sale. Today's weapons are extremely effective technological jewels, so it's natural for the market to be strictly controlled from an administrative point of view. First of all, before exporting anything, companies must comply with a very strict procedure. According to the arms treaty, the seller and buyer are required to create what is called an end user certificate. The end user certificate is a document containing information about the buyer. When we say the buyer, it means the final user in the country. It could be for law enforcement, for border guarding, for palace guarding. All this information should be indicated. Simonetta Grassi heads the anti-arms trafficking department at the UNODC, the United Nations office that's responsible for gathering global data about organized crime. This is a mechanism whereby um, that requires a certain responsibility and certain controls at the level of the exporting country, at the level of the importing country, um, uh, before, during and after the, the delivery. The aim of this type of certificate is to ensure that the final user complies with what he declared when he bought the weapons. The importing country has also a responsibility because they have to verify, of course, that, um, uh, first of all, that the, the, the signature of the exporting country is valid. Moreover, all of the sector's companies are required to mark each weapon's frame with a serial number. As such, the weapon can be traced and identified if it's found in the wrong hands or at a crime scene. If everything is in order, a company can sell its products and make a profit. So the question arises, how, despite everything, do thousands and even millions of weapons end up on the black market, in the hands of criminal organizations or with terrorists? Uh, one peculiar characteristic of the illicit arms trafficking is that there is a legal and an illegal market uh, that coexist and that, uh, I would say, influence each other mutually. Understanding how the two markets coexist is the key to grasping trafficking on a worldwide scale. Between the legal and illegal markets, there is a dark zone, a shadowy distribution network. It's called the gray market. Weapons are ready to be sold to the four corners of the world. If all of their papers are in order, they will be found in the hands of legitimate buyers. It's clean, it's clear. It's called the white market. When a government decides to bypass formalities in order to sell weapons secretly for strategic or political reasons, it's called the gray market. It was revealed by the Cold War. Today, it's more difficult to bring to light, but weapons diplomacy has always existed. Today, this is more striking, more studied and analyzed. Today, we have a clearer knowledge of arms selling motivation. Armed diplomacy has various possibilities. That is, you're going to have armed diplomacy by lowering your requirements regarding human rights. And the key to regional stability will be arming the states. You have armed diplomacy consisting of equipping an actor who is a non-state actor with arms sometimes to fight against a belligerent state. That's another kind of armed diplomacy. And we saw it very often during the Cold War. The USA armed anti-communist guerrillas in South America. 
anti-communiste. In fact, arms are just provided, with the danger that they might be used for human rights violations or might be redistributed. This is what happened around 20 years ago in Croatia, at the gates of Europe. Miho Bokarica is a former Croatian soldier. He was responsible for the intelligence service in the Dubrovnik region during the war against Serbia from 1990 to 1995. In 1990, the country proclaimed its independence and elected Franjo Tudjman president of the new republic. The state, the second Yugoslavia, had a big autonomy in weapons production. In short, we had all the weapons we needed because we were self-sufficient in terms of arms production. The situation didn't last because the Serbs had literally emptied weapon stocks in the Croatian territory to take them back to Serbia. The Croatian invasion had been carefully prepared. The contenders for independence found themselves unarmed against a modern, well-equipped army. We bought whatever we could. Weapons arrived from everywhere, even from Serbia. That the Serbs sold their weapons to the Croatians to fight their own army seems unbelievable. But it's a classic battlefield move. For example, French, American and English weapons were used against coalition forces during the Gulf War. The fact that business comes first is as shocking as it seems. But it was fortunate for the Croatians, because weapons started to flow. We received weapons, by all means, from numerous countries, and it was done by all possible and conceivable ways from the emigrated diaspora from Canada, Argentina, and other countries. We bought weapons from whoever wanted to sell. We bought good and bad ones, because we needed to survive. Even today, you'll never know the truth about the origin of these weapons. A mixture of black market and parallel diplomacy. In reality, it was because as a state, we had not had a legal diplomacy and we had no weapons. We were helped by a hidden diplomacy from Croats around the world who used different networks to send us the weapons. None of these arms existed officially, and for good reason, it was secret. They had bypassed the usual authorizations and checks. It's also the case for all clandestine deliveries that a government will make to a group of insurgents or to a government that's fighting them depending on the strategy of the moment. If a state uh, sends weapons to another state, um, even if it is in form of a donation, the expectation would be that the receiving state keeps the arms uh, under certain control. Um, when the weapons are not directed to states but to insurgent groups, then we start having other types of problems. Um, and if these are groups that are in countries that are under arms embargo, then we have, again, another type of, of problem, of course. In this kind of situation, governments are directly involved. Embargo countries defy international sanctions and continue to stock up. The only way to get a hint about the trafficking is to look at seizures. In 2016, a ship from North Korea was intercepted with 24,384 anti-tank weapon parts and 4,616 parts to build rocket launchers on board. The ship was en route to Egypt. In the same year, in Saudi Arabia, more than 5,000 Kalashnikovs were seized as well as ground air missiles, mortars and tons of munitions bound for Yemen. Authorities suspect that Iran was behind the trafficking. Weapons are a kind of merchandise that's highly strategic for a country. And given this, some countries don't hesitate to operate illegally, much to the benefit of dealers. We're talking about thousands of weapons. To organize all this, you need experts, intermediaries with loads of contacts. Among the most famous, Victor Bout, 
played by Nicolas Cage in the film Lord of War. His technique? Falsify the end user certificates. The end user certificates have very often been diverted, have been subject to trafficking, and have allowed an illicit arms trade to be organized. Like the case of Victor Boot in Sierra Leone and Liberia, where conflict brought suffering to the countries, he and his men used false end user certificates. They went to see the country from which they were going to purchase the weapons, and they said, Here's the end user certificate. Weapons are for this country. It's guaranteed for this use and for these actors. The problem is that the country who supposedly provided the end user certificate was not aware of this purchase. Apart from the traffickers, no one knows what happens to these weapons. They feed the fighters as long as the conflicts last. The question that no one seems to be asking is, what happens to the weapons when peace returns? Certainly, conflict zones around the globe contribute heavily to illegal firearms movement. Guns that are left behind after, after conflicts or battles, uh, guns that are, are stored after the conflict. They're gathered up, inventoried, stored, uh, and, and can be stolen. This is what happened in what used to be Yugoslavia, and more generally, in all of the countries from the former Soviet Union. Well, in different regions of the world, they, it, is, it is quite commonplace to look for the last conflict zone. And if it wasn't necessarily a conflict, it was perhaps a regime change or a government type change. And that presents opportunities for contraband. And unfortunately, what's, what we've seen in some parts of Africa is that there are firearms coming out of, out of a country in which uh, leadership, there was leadership change. And that becomes now the problem of the region, not just the problem that the country that had the, those firearms, but they are moving to other, other uh, locations on the continent. Today, Iraq is a weapons store. It's been fed with weapons for years and years. We brought out a report on Iraq not so long ago, one and a half years ago. And in the report, we mentioned that some of our Milan and hot missiles had been found in the hands of Daesh. How does this kind of equipment find itself in the hands of Daesh? In this situation, we see the limits of armed diplomacy. Uh, as conflicts arise, sometimes it's a million or two million or three guns that go missing after a conflict. That is decades of problems for law enforcement and for citizens that become the victims with those those guns once used illegally. The illicit arms trade uses the same methods as most other trafficking networks. Existing legal weaknesses, political cogs through corruption, economic corruption, bribery, and they manage to get the necessary authorization to make the business look legal and to remain undetectable. So that's how legally produced weapons end up in the hands of criminal organizations. They traffic far fewer weapons, but it's perfectly calibrated to feed the organized crime market, also called the black market. Legal trade is highly regulated, but paradoxically, there is an incalculable number of clandestine weapons scattered around the world. In the criminal economy's logic, it's an ideal situation to develop a particularly profitable business. The raw materials are available, and buyers prefer to remain anonymous. These weapon stocks that were stolen or recovered from conflict zones are sold retail or semi-wholesale. Trafficking takes on many different faces, and sometimes there are containers of firearms, uh, whether they're buried, after shipment, whether they are, whether they might be recovered on a on a ship, or but oftentimes they go undetected and get out into the streets. But whether it's a container or whether it's a a single individual with three guns in the boot of his car, they're all traffickers. And they're, for every different trafficker, they've got a different manner of doing things. But I think all of us can agree that weapons trafficking is the illegal movement, the non authorized movement of firearms, both domestically and internationally. And it should never be limited by the number of firearms that have moved, whether it's two guns 
or whether it's over 100 or 500 crime guns, it's all to be considered trafficking. It's difficult to say, to quantify what is big, what is, what yeah. is small trafficking, no? And um, there, for example, there are regions or countries where the traffic is done, especially in small quantities, but in a steady way. If you look the traffic between the United States and Mexico, for example, but this is not the only example, these are always small quantities that are trafficked, maybe in vehicles, in buses, in, uh, in uh, hidden in in, um, in cargoes that that are transporting illicit goods, um, but often not more than a few. The point is that demand is as constant as it is diverse. Customers don't all have the same needs. They could be simple collectors, or criminal organizations, or terrorist cells. The firearm is a tool of so many different types of criminals. And so where a drug investigator is targeting drugs, he may find his, his suspect has a gun. The same with human traffickers, they may have guns. Until today, when drug traffickers were caught, it was a priority to investigate the drug's origins. Confronted with the threat that arms trafficking represents, police attitudes are changing. It's our job here at Interpol to help a lot of investigators around the, uh, around the globe to, to understand that it's time to refocus our ideas on what a firearms investigation is. Let's not be satisfied with finding a drug trafficker with a gun and have that gun off the street. Let's find out who put that gun in the drug trafficker's hands or the human trafficker's hands. Let's find the firearms trafficker, just like we're looking for the gun tra or for the drug trafficker and for the human trafficker. That is a different mindset in a number of countries, certainly not everywhere, but that is a different mindset to start thinking about the firearms trafficker and targeting them from the moment you get intelligence or a recovery of a firearm. On the black market, the number sold is rather limited. They don't need to arm an army, but rather a gang or a terrorist cell. This spread of weapons makes the work of law enforcement particularly tedious. It's a puzzle made even more complicated by the enormous differences in arms regulations from one country to another. There is no universal definition for weapons trafficking because the legislation is so different and varied across the continents. This is typically what we see on the border between French Guiana and Brazil. In France, you can buy a weapon legally as long as you have a hunting license, a gun license, and you meet a certain number of legal conditions. In Brazil, gun possession is forbidden. But to travel from one country to the other, you only have to cross a river. Each year, Brazilian police sees thousands of weapons that were obtained quite legally. So there are people who take advantage of this laxity to buy weapons in French Guiana, to bring them into the Brazilian territory illegally. Many of these weapons have been bought or come from French Guiana. Some countries, even within Europe, allow civilians to have even a relatively large number of weapons. So getting a weapon legally is not a problem, as long as you comply with certain legal obligations. But these procedures completely disappear if you buy a demilitarized weapon. At Moscow's airport, there's a rather special shop. It's a store that's dedicated to the Kalashnikov brand. T-shirts, lighters, gun replicas, anyone can buy a Kalashnikov, and business is good. Some models could be mistaken for the originals. That's normal, because they've come from the same production lines. Uh, it was a real gun. It was produced like a real gun. But uh, it's in, in the sale right now after some changes. And it classes the class of that gun. It's just a mock-up. You know that a weapon, according to the firearms protocol, um, uh, deactivated weapons must be rendered permanently inoperable. That means they are no longer considered weapons. So they are no longer subject to the same regime of controls of import, export, and transit regulation. There's little chance of seeing a Kalashnikov shooting real bullets, at least theoretically. But there are always loopholes, and some crafty criminals have been quick to use them. 
Nicholas Florkin is an expert at the Small Arms Survey Agency. His role is to collect and analyze all the data available on arms trafficking to inform law enforcement around the world. We can talk about the neutralized arms sector in Slovakia, transformed into blank weapons in Slovakia, and which some criminal networks hasten to reconvert. Then they scatter them in several European states, and we talk of several hundreds or several thousands of illegal weapons through this sector. And we are not talking about the Balkans, but about the European Union. It is clear that individuals are doing this process. It can be an individual who does this on his own, by doing his research on the internet, or by talking to other experts, or collectors who do that for their own interest. The internet. Just like in the legal economy, illicit online commerce has exploded. Selling arms illegally is highly developed, but not necessarily in the way we might think. Buying a weapon from the web is truly available to everyone. When you hear about arms trafficking on the internet, you immediately think about the dark web, the mysterious internet where all forms of criminality have found refuge. The reality is much more frightening. Nick Jensen Jones is a consultant for the agency Ares, a company specialized in identifying new ways of trafficking weapons. So we've definitely monitored the dark web and we continue to, and there are weapons that are sold there. The majority of them seem to be handguns and some self-loading rifles. But in places that are in conflict zones or post-conflict zones or fragile states, it tends to be the case that that traffic has not been forced to the dark web. We tend to see more of that usage in uh, sort of stable, uh, stable, primarily democratic states. Selling a weapon on the dark web is more a way for a few clever people to make some easy money. But in general, it's a scam. Neil Walsh, who heads the cybercrime department at the UNODC, found just that during his investigations. There was some really nice research done by RAND Corporation, um, along with the University of Manchester earlier this year, on darknet weapons markets. And they were scanning the darknet looking for the availability of weapons. And we're talking handguns, magazines, ammunition, long weapons, automatic, semi-automatic, right the way through to what, what's out there. But when they actually dug into those and tried to, to really clarify, are they real or are they not, there was only a very small percentage of the weapons that were allegedly on sale seemed to be real weapons that could be sold and could be sent to a buyer. So like lots of things on the dark net, we come across things that we call an exit scam, where I, if I'm a criminal, I could advertise that I will sell you a Glock, an MP5, whatever. You send your money, there is no gun but I've got your money, you have no idea who I am, you have no way of getting your money back. On the other hand, in conflict zones, internet is the perfect platform to handle this kind of business. And for that, there's no need to plunge into the dark web. In Libya and also in, in Syria, uh, and also in Yemen, we've seen evidence of uh, guided weapons being sold via these relatively common social media platforms that you and I use. Um, so things like Man portable air defense systems, the shoulder fired surface to air missiles, um, anti tank guided weapons, which are anti tank missiles and man portable. These types of weapons are traded on these, um, you know, sort of semi closed networks. Access to these networks is available to everyone. Nevertheless, you still have to know where to search to find an AK 47. On the other hand, with a simple click, you can easily get an ultra modern assault rifle if you've got the money. Once again, high-tech traffickers are using regulatory weaknesses to their benefit. So the modalities are changing. The, the, the market is dynamic to a certain extent, and, and you see changes depending also on the technological advancement. Um, then you have also another uh, new modality that is also concerned, that, that raises concern, and this is the trafficking of parts and components of unfinished weapons. Today, you can legally purchase from the internet any part of a firearm, except for the receiver, which is the most important part, in addition to some components that are kept secret. But that remains theoretical. If you want a real automatic rifle or the latest revolver, do a Google search. You just need to type Blueprint, the name of the weapon you want, and you can get the weapon's technical plans is the issue that you can download from the internet the blueprints, so the, the instructions on how 
to manufacture a weapon. So you can purchase easily on the legal market a 3D printer, but the ability to get, not even through the darknet, but through the internet, through the open source, uh, access to blueprints that give you the, the, the instruction, the step-by-step -step instructions of how to assemble, how to convert a weapon into an automatic weapon, this is also something that needs to be looked at and, and, and more stronger regulated. And the craziest thing is that it's not illegal to post blueprints for weapons on the internet, nor is it illegal to download them. Laws evolve much less quickly than criminals' modus operandi. In the United States, the blueprint concept has been improved by Ghost Gunner, a group of gun enthusiasts 2.0. Instructions are downloaded to automatic milling machines. Parts are machined directly in garages and sent to customers. The advantage for criminals who wish to acquire these parts is that they have no identifying marks. These are ghost weapons. They are thought to be over 500 in circulation throughout the United States. Oh no, it's reality that firearms are available on the internet. And it's difficult for law enforcement because we do not monitor the entire internet. We know that would be impossible. The number of illegal weapons in circulation is unknown, but there are certainly several million. Distribution networks are as diverse as they are varied and concern countries, criminal organizations, and individuals. So it's practically impossible to have a clear idea of this traffic. Uh, I think it is safe to say that the illicit market is, is very large in scale. In most countries, uh, firearms are moving across international borders, or there's a large supply domestically but once they get into the hands of criminals, there are uh, plenty of crime guns, uh, city to city or country to country. Firearm proliferation seems inevitable as long as the market prospers. It depends on two economic factors that are common to all forms of commerce, highly effective marketing and a mountain of money. Since we don't want to sink to speculation and announce numbers that are as crazy as they are inexact, we must simply admit that we have no idea how much money arms trafficking generates. This is due, amongst other things, to the opaque veil that shrouds the production and sale of arms on the market. Of course, many experts are working on it, but to no avail for the moment. Really, the key is to use an all-source approach. Anyone who's telling you there's one answer to this is, is probably lying. It's, it's like any sort of intelligence challenge. It's about looking at the problem from as many angles as possible. And so you compare data from the field with data from export registers, with data from the producing company or the producing state and the exporting state, their licensing agency or uh, authority, the importing countries, uh, various authorities. There are lots of different pieces of the puzzle. One of the reasons that the black market is difficult to measure is that it's impossible to know what happens to weapons legally acquired by individuals. To whom and at what price these weapons can be sold is simply impossible to determine. On the other hand, we know that it amounts to millions of weapons. In France, there are 31 guns legally purchased for every 100 citizens. In Iraq, it's a bit more, 34 guns for 100 citizens. But in the United States, the number is 101 guns for every 100 citizens. One thing is sure, if the market interests traffickers, it's firstly because it's a quick way to rake in big profits. So the businessman in the illegal market will look to source the firearm in the least expensive place as possible. And once they do that, generally speaking, they already know where they can get a good price for that. And so the, the price gets marked up three, four, five, eight, ten times more than what they've paid for in the one region of the country or the continent that they purchased it. If we look at the price of weapons in the Balkans, we immediately notice the huge difference in prices. We are talking about several thousand euros for a Kalashnikov in France or Belgium and a few hundred in some Balkan countries. The price of illegal arms has soared since the Paris terrorist attacks in 2015. Law enforcement has stepped up their efforts to limit arms trafficking. The authorities' united front has rendered the market riskier and has driven it even more underground. Prices reflect that. If a Glock cost around 1,000 euros in the early 2000s, it's difficult to get one for less than 3,000 euros today. 
But as it's an indispensable tool for all criminal activity, the market is still as dynamic as it is prosperous. And then we'll sell it for, like I said, up to 10 times that amount because they can find the, uh, the customer willing to pay that price. Uh, because you've got terrorists on the other end who are looking to get, to get firearms. You are looking at, uh, at uh, organized crime. Both entities have the money to pay top dollar, as we say, or top euro for a firearm. And so the, the, just because they can get a gun cheaply in the illegal market doesn't mean they're going to sell it cheaply. It's considered a niche market. Consumers are ready to pay high prices to buy a product that seems indispensable to them. In addition, traffickers profit from the formidable marketing of traditional brands. Once again, it's all gravy for the criminals. The black market benefits from the dynamism and powerful marketing tools of official commerce. Let's see how it works. Ready? Just as in the legal economy, there are best sellers, and the AK-47 is an unquestionable bestseller. Amnesty International made this offbeat film to show just how easy it is to find an AK-47, and that the illegal arms market is a market like any other. Welcome back. So, from ice cream makers, thanks, Jim, to weaponry. Now, what have we got today, Clive? Well, today we have got the villain's favourite. A veteran of more than 75 wars, it's the AK-47 assault rifle. Now, so come over here, let me show you this in its full splendour. Here it is. Beautiful. Now, we have 10,000 of these in secret locations outside the UK to sell today. Even on the black market, there are trends, flagship products that are snapped up for a king's ransom. The advantage for sellers is that they don't need costly advertising campaigns to promote this kind of product. It just happens naturally. So there are, yeah, so there are two, two factors at play there. One, the reputation the weapon has on a wider market, which trickles down even into a conflict zone. Even in Libya, for example, or in Syria, we know that people in these conflict zones have been influenced by TV, by Western media, by video games, and they make references to video games in the way they describe some weapons. So we know that there's, you know, a, definitely a value associated with weapons based on their prestige, which is reflected in, in, uh, in the media but also, of course, based on its reliability, its reputation within the military. Um, so maybe if something's been adopted by a special forces unit within the country of question, then that weapon might be seen as being more reliable or more prestigious. Prices align in consequence and can rise to several thousands of euros for one weapon. But what interests most buyers is that the merchandise is efficient enough to do what it was made to do, and that comes down to one word, kill. But there are a number of places in Europe and, in, and, and others where just being able to acquire any firearm is more important than getting the best quality firearm or the latest model of a firearm. So if there are plenty of firearms on the street, criminals can be selective in what they purchase. But if you're talking about regions in which there are not that many firearms, for whatever reason, but primarily regulation, then criminals will be paying higher prices for whatever type of firearm they can get their hands on and not necessarily the best or the latest model. We can't even accurately determine the value of a firearm. There are no discounts on the black market. The fact that a gun has already been used doesn't make it cheaper. That's the big advantage with this kind of product. Manufacturers don't need planned obsolescence. The same rifle can be sold and resold as long as it can shoot. In Dubrovnik's War Museum, you can find AK-47s and even Mauser rifles from World War II. They are still functional today. If you do not destroy a weapon, if you do not really destroy it, if you do not screw it up, you have a problem. They can work for a hundred years. They can still shoot. Then, it's a problem. The only way to try to limit the number of guns in circulation is to seize and destroy them. Every year in Bosnia or Herzegovina, they use an industrial smelter to melt down all the guns confiscated in the country the previous year. It's an opportunity for officials to show their goodwill. 
But in reality, these destruction campaigns only account for a tiny percentage of all the weapons still circulating in the country. Authorities estimate that there are still more than 100,000 illegal arms in the country. At this pace, it will take 50 years to eliminate them. That is, if they can find them and if they haven't left the territory one way or another. And when we see conflict zones in Eastern Europe with millions of guns gone missing, we have to be prepared to address that and work with the countries in that region to be tracing every firearm that they recover, listing them, getting them organized as quickly as possible for inventories for what they still have, so that if they're stolen, tracing guns or querying guns and I arms in an Interpol's database presents the latest information for an investigative lead. Despite all of the international treaties and the laws that regulate arms sales, illegal trafficking remains profitable. The more conflict and political instability there is, the more the sale of legal arms increases. Producing countries are not ready to give up a nearly infinite source of revenue and jobs. Closing a factory has both an economic cost and a social cost. The regret we can have in France is that we think in terms of weapons sold, in terms of jobs created, in microeconomic terms. Will the company be able to maintain jobs? These are legitimate concerns. We're not against the arms trade as such. But we have to admit that certain transfers should never have taken place. And certain transfers will feed the traffic. So the future looks bright for traffickers. Most of their stock is already on the world's production lines. And what's most attractive for them is that their customers are ready to pay astronomical sums to get their merchandise. It's also a way for mafias to spend their dirty money. Some of the drug traffickers' money goes into the pockets of arms traffickers. They keep it in the family. As part of our research, especially at the beginning of our work on this specific issue of arms trade, there's the link with drug trafficking, particularly in South America. And in Africa too. Drug trafficking gives you access to firearms. It sometimes even creates the need for weapons. Very often, in fact. Um, if you look at uh, the illicit market in Latin America and the Caribbean, there is a clear connection to organized crime, gang violence, uh, drug trafficking. And there, the connection is, is, is uh, very... You, you can also see it because there are very, very high uh, rates of um, homicides committed with guns in several of these countries in that region. So the armed violence and the illicit, uh, the other illicit activities are closely connected to the weapons trafficking. This map shows the countries with the highest number of homicides a year. The darker the color, the more murders there are. The countries involved in drug trafficking are at the top of the list. Colombia with 14,000 deaths, Mexico with 20,000 deaths, and Brazil, where each year 70,000 people fall victim to a violent death caused by an illegal weapon. If we compare the markets, and, and I said I cannot give figures, but what can be said is that clearly the illicit drug market is uh, more profitable than uh, the illicit arms market. But the illicit arms market is um, interesting or is uh, prominent not only because of its economic uh, profit that you can get out of it, it is also because it is interlinked, it facilitates, it encourages, it, it uh, enhances the power of those who want to make use of those arms for illicit purposes. We have to resign ourselves to this paradox. Organized crime relies indirectly on the legal arms industry not only to make substantial profits, but also to show its power and increase business. It's difficult to be optimistic. It's a source of endless profits in both the legal and criminal economies. The more weapons mafias have, the more law enforcement will need to arm itself for self-protection and to ensure citizens' safety. It's a deadly, vicious circle, except for the economy. These two consumer groups boost the market, benefiting both legal companies in the sector and transnational traffickers. A weapon is just a tool, a piece of merchandise, well before it becomes an instrument of good or evil. 
As such, arms trafficking is nothing less than a market like any other. Well, almost. What do you think child soldiers are using in the likes of Liberia and the Democratic Republic of Congo? Not one of these. <laughs> they are. They're using AK-47s, right? Well, I tell you what, we've got Sam in the studio now, haven't we? And he's mm. going to do a demo. OK, Sam, so in your own time, whenever you're ready. Wow, that Looking is up. seriously impressive.